Okay, we are starting chapter six today. And chapter six has a lot of really important stuff, but it kind of feels like a lot of little things kind of all bunched together, and they don't all flow very nicely from one thing to another, just giving you a heads up about that. But they're all really important and all very foundational to be able to use algebra as you move forward in your math education. So I think we're on notes number 30 today. And it's called Roots and Rational Exponents, or you could say Radicals and Rational Exponents. And this comes from section 6.1 as well as section 6.2. So we're going through quite a lot, um, a lot of little stuff. Okay, so first of all, you see I have a column that has some radical notation, and I have a column that has some exponent notation. And we want to try to make these comparable. So on the left, you see square root 3 times square root 3. We know that equals 3. So on the right, 3 to what power times 3 to what power equals 3. Now here's the condition. We want those two powers to be the same. So what should I put in those white boxes? The same number in each box so that when I multiply, I get 3. Now remember, 3 is 3 to the first. And so what two numbers add to 1 and they're the same number? It would have to be 1 half and 1 half. So what that's telling us is that the square root of 3 is equivalent to 3 to the 1 half power. Okay, similarly, using other kinds of radicals, the cube root of 7 times the cube root of 7 times the cube root of 7 is 7. Now what about 7 to a power times 7 to the same power times 7 to the same power equals 7, which would be 7 to the first. What would those exponents have to be? What plus itself plus itself is 1, and that would be 1 third. So what that's telling us is that the cube root of 7 is equivalent to 7 to the 1 third power. Now I want to generalize it a little bit. So down here on the third one, let's say we have n of these radicals. So we have n of these radicals. Um, we would have to call it the nth root. So the nth root of 5 times the nth root of 5, etc., etc., all the way down. If you add n of those, together that would be the nth root of 5 to the n power. And that would just be 5. So if you have n 5 to the something power, what would that something be in order to get 5 to the first? It would have to be 5 to the 1 over n power. Because if you have 5 to the 1 over n power multiplied by itself n times, and you think about your exponent properties, power to a power, you multiply the exponents, you would just get a 1 there for the exponent. So then to generalize this, we can say that a, the base, whatever it happens to be, raised to the power 1 over n is equivalent to the nth root of a. So this is a rational exponent here because the exponent is a fraction and this is a radical here. The, the uh, nth root of a is a radical. So the most commonly used ones are going to be a to the one half power is the square root of a. a to the one th third power is the cube root of a. And a to the one fourth power is the fourth root of a. Now, you could also have a rational exponent that doesn't have a numerator of 1. You could have a rational exponent that has some other numerator. So you see here I have a to the m over n. The denominator part of it still represents the kind of root you have, the kind of radical you have. And the numerator part of it is still just representing it being raised to a power. So a to the power m over n is equal to, you can write it one of two ways, the nth root of a to the m or the nth root of a to the m. Now some people like to use kind of a picture for this, so here's your tree. You're going to love my artistry here. Artistry, get it, tree, haha. -ha. Here are the roots down below the surface. So the roots are below and the powers are above. Like the oh, I forgot to draw that part of the picture. This is the power line. So the roots are below and the powers are above. So see up here, if I was to write this like a to the m over n, the power is above, the root is below. 
So that just gives you kind of a nice visual for remembering what goes where. Okay, now let's simplify these two expressions here that are just numerical. And what we can do is rewrite it in whichever way is most convenient for simplifying this, especially if you're simplifying it in your head. I really don't want you to just plug these in your calculator. That doesn't really help you practice the properties. So what I want you to do is think of 125 to the 2 thirds power as 125 to the 1 third power squared, or even the cube root of 125 squared. And I like to do the cube root part of this problem first because we know the cube root of 125 is 5. So that simplifies nicely. So this is 5 squared, so that means it's equivalent to 25. Now similarly for the next one, 8 to the negative 4 thirds power. Remember, using our exponent properties, and by the way, I haven't stated it explicitly, but all the exponent properties that we went over at the beginning of chapter 5, and we used integer exponents there, all of those properties still apply when you're using rational exponents. All the same properties. So, let's get rid of the negative exponent by making this 1 over 8 to the 4 thirds power. And then I'm going to do kind of like what I did in the previous example by thinking of 8 to the 4 thirds power as 8 to the 1 third power to the 4th, or even thinking of it as 1 over the cube root of 8 to the 4th, because we know the cube root of 8 simplifies to just be 2. So we have 1 over 2 to the 4th power, and that would be 1 16th. Okay. Now I want to talk about the difference between talking about roots using words and describing roots with symbols, or you could say radicals or roots either way. When I'm using the word root in this chapter, I'm not referring to a zero of a function like in the last chapter, but I'm referring to a radical. So hopefully that's not confusing. So if you were to use the words find the real sixth roots of 64, you would be saying, find the numbers, maybe there's one, maybe there's more than one, that you could raise to the sixth power and get 64. Well, there are actually two numbers that you could raise to the sixth power and get 64. You could get the number two, because two to the sixth is 64, or the number negative two. Negative two to the sixth is 64. However, if I'm going to use the symbol, the sixth root symbol, or the one-sixth power symbol, those refer to only the principal root. And honestly, I don't remember which spelling of principal to use here. I hope I didn't mess that up. Hopefully you'll forgive me if I did. The principal root is the positive root. So just like when we learned about square roots, the square root symbol means the positive root or the positive radical, positive result. So if you see these symbols, we're only referring to two, not two or negative two. Okay, how about problem two? In words, find the real sixth roots of negative 64. What number could you raise to the sixth power and get negative 64? What real number? Actually, there is no real number that you could raise to the sixth power and get negative 64 because if it's negative and you raise it to the sixth, you get a positive. If it's positive and raise it to the sixth, you get a positive. And similarly, if we use this notation, we're referring to the positive root. Either way, well, there's still none. Number three, find the real cube root or roots of 64. I'm getting a lot of bang for my buck out of the number 64 because it's a power of so many things. So is there a number that you could cube and get 64. Something cubed is 64. Actually, yes, the number 4. What about the number negative 4? Is negative 4 cubed also 64? Nope, because if you cube a negative, you get a negative, right? So actually, for a cube root, in words, you only get one answer. For a sixth root, in words, you get two answers. Can you imagine what the generalization is? We have an even here. We have an odd here, so I imagine you know how we're going to generalize this. What about using the symbol? The cube root of 64 would mean the positive one. Well, 4 is positive, 
and 64 to the 1 3rd power would mean the positive root. So either way you get 4. So for number 3, the answer to the word problem, the problem in words, is actually the same as the answer to the symbol problem, whereas in number 1 it was not the same. And then number 4, find the real cube root or roots of negative 64. Well remember up here in number 2, when we were taking the sixth roots of negative 64, there were none, no real roots. But if it's a cube root, there is a number that you can cube and get a negative, negative 64. You could cube negative 4 and get negative 64, so negative 4 is the answer. And even with this symbol, a cube root symbol, I think I probably misspoke when I was doing this one up here. You don't have to have a positive result for a cube root. If you're taking the cube root of a negative, you get a negative, whether you put it with a radical sign or whether you put it with an exponent, either way. Those notations mean the same thing. Okay, so if we were to generalize, I might have missed that. Oops. If we were to generalize about this, looks like I don't have a slide about that, but if it's an even kind of root, the number here is called the index. So if it has an even index, then you would have two roots, but the radical sign leads you just to the positive one. If it's an odd root, with an odd index, you're going to have one answer, positive for a positive, a negative for a negative, um, whether you use words or the symbol. Okay, switching gears a little bit, now let's simplify a bunch of expressions. So we're going to use our exponent properties and do the same things we would do if we were using um, integer exponents. So if you have 12 to a power times 12 to a power, you want to add those exponents. So we want 12 to the power of 1 8 plus 5, 6. So you're going to have to get a common denominator, which would be 24, 12 to the 3 24ths plus 20 24ths. So this is 12 to the 23 24ths. Now do you need to change it into radical notation? It didn't say so. If it just says simplify, my rule of thumb is leave it in the kind of notation it started with when it just says simplify. If it says change, then change. Number six, we have a base to a power times a different base to a power, and that's all raised to the power. So this is following the property a times b to the n is equal to a to the n times b to the n. We're just going to raise both of them to the third power. So that would be five to the one-third to the third times seven to the one-fourth to the third. So that means we have five, because when we multiply one-third times three, we get one times 7 to the 3 fourths, and we'll just leave it like that. Notice that I cannot make this 35 to the 3 fourths, because the 5 is not being raised to the 3 fourths. Number 7 is um, 10 to a power of 1 divided by 10 to the power of 2 fifths, so remember the exponent property would be to subtract the powers. 1 minus 2 fifths is 3 fifths, so 10 to the 3 fifths power. And then number eight is kind of like number six, but we also have a negative exponent involved in the situation here. I'm just gonna go ahead and raise them both to the negative one-sixth power to start with. The order in which you do things could vary here. You could still end up with the same result, just using the properties properly. So two to the sixth to the negative one-sixth is two to the negative one. Four to the sixth to the negative one-sixth is four to the negative one. So we have 1 over 2 times 4 because of the negative exponent, move it to the bottom. So these are just, or this problem is just going to simplify to be 1 eighth. We could have started it differently. We could have rewritten 2 to the 6th times 4 to the 6th as 8 to the 6th, and then raise that to the negative 1 6th, and we would still end up with the same thing. Looks like number 9 is sneaking in here at the bottom. So, um, just like I mentioned with number eight, I could have simplified inside the parentheses first. I think I'll do that for this one. So simplifying inside the parentheses first. Since both bases are being raised to the one-fourth power, we can think of it as 56 sevenths to the one-fourth, and 56 sevenths is eight. So this is eight to the one-fourth power to the fifth power. So this is eight to the five-fourths power. Now, what you might notice at times is that um, sometimes your book or maybe another mathematician or another teacher might simplify this further because when you have a improper fraction exponent, some people don't like to leave it like that. 
So if you thought of it as 8 to the first times 8 to the 1 fourth, since 1 plus 1 fourth is 5 fourths, then you would just write this as 8 times 8 to the 1 fourth. Now you could break it down even more if you were going to um, break down the 8 into 2 cubed. So you have 8 times 2 cubed to the 1 fourth. That would be 8 times 2 to the 3 fourths. You could write it like that too. So there's many different ways to simplify and write the answer. And I really don't want to get all hung up about it. Like I'm not going to say it's absolutely this way or absolutely that way. Mostly I want you to practice these properties. Okay, so the last page was a bunch of exponent form. Now we have a bunch of radical form problems that we're going to simplify. So remember when earlier in the year, I think it was chapter 4, we simplified square roots? Well, now we're going to simplify other radicals besides square roots, like cube roots. So if you remember back to something like this, if you had the square root of, say, 80, then you would look for perfect squares that go into 80, like square root 16 times 5, since 16 is a perfect square. And the square root of 16 is 4, so you get 4 square root 5. It's a lot like that with cubes, except instead of having a perfect square on the inside, you need to have a perfect cube on the inside. So let's think about 104. 104 is 2 times 52, and 52 is 2 times 26, and 26 is 2 times 13. Okay, so the cube root of 104 is the same as the cube root of 2 cubed times 13. Or you could think of that as 8 times 13. So the cube root of 2 cubed is 2, so we're going to have a 2 on the outside. And then we have the cube root of 13, since 13 is not a perfect cube. Let's do number 11. Now you might be tempted to start by combining and multiplying 32 and 30 together. And then you're going to get a large number like what is it? I don't know, 960 or something. And then you have to break that down. So why make yourself make it bigger and, uh, and just to make it smaller again? Why do that? Why not break it down now? So 32 is 2 to the fifth, right? And 30 is 3 times 10, so 3 times 2 times 5. So now let's think of this as the cube root of 2 to the fifth times 3 times 2 times 5, all under one radical. And that is the cube root of 2 to the 6th times 3 times 5. Now some of these steps you're going to do in your head. You're not necessarily going to write. And then you could even think of that as the cube root of 2 cubed times 2 cubed times 3 times 5. So you're finding your perfect cubes that are inside the cube root. So each time you have the cube root of 2 cubed, you're going to have a 2. So you have a 2 on the outside and another 2 on the outside. And then you have the cube root of 15 on the inside. So this is 4 cube root 15. Now please take a moment when you're writing these to make sure you're writing them clearly because you don't want it to look like this. That looks like I'm cubing the 4 and I have a square root of 15. Or maybe it's unclear. So make sure you write it in a way that makes it clear. Okay, number 12. So, I could choose to simplify the numerator if possible and simplify the denominator if possible first, or I could choose to combine them first. And I'm going to combine them first because I know that 96 is divisible by 3. 96 divided by 3 is 32. And also 32 is 2 to the 5th power. And the 5th root of 2 to the 5th power is 2. So that one worked out really nicely. Number 13. Okay, could I combine these together and reduce it like I did on number 12? Well, it would be nice, but 10 and 27 don't reduce. Could I find any perfect somethings to the fourths and factor them out? Well, there aren't any in there. So, we have a problem. It doesn't simplify. However, we have a radical on the bottom, and we don't like to leave a radical on the bottom. It's considered not simplified. So I need to show you how to rationalize the denominator when you have a fourth root or something other than a square root. So here's what I'm going to recommend. Take your denominator and break it down into primes. So 27 is 3 cubed. Now when we were rationalizing denominators with square roots, 
let's say we had something like square root 10 over square root 3, we could just multiply the top and bottom by square root 3 because we know that square root 3 times square root 3 is 3. Well, in this case, we need to find a special form of 1 to multiply by so that what we end up with on the bottom is just 3. Now, we have to multiply a fourth root by a fourth root, so our special form of 1 is going to be the fourth root of something over the fourth root of that same something. Now, if I already have the fourth root of 3 to the third power, and I multiply by the fourth root of 3 to the first power, that would give me altogether on the bottom the fourth root of 3 to the fourth power, and that's going to be 3. So you look at what kind of root do you have? It's a 4. How many 3's do you have? I have 3 of them. How many more you, do you need? One more to get a total of 4. So that means I'm multiplying the top by the same thing. So we're multiplying the top and the bottom by the 4th root of 3. So this gives us the 4th root of 30 over 3. Okay. Well, I have a little bit more to go. Let's see, 14, 15, 16, a little bit more there, 17, 18, 19. Ooh, this is a long lesson. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we're going to end this video and make a second video. Hang in there, everybody. You're going to be okay.